Okay, so in this video, I'm just going to take you through our um, guiding question speech um, and picking apart some of the features and some of the techniques and some of the ideas that I've used in this um, waggle to show you how straightforward it can be to write a really engaging speech. Okay, so just looking at the introduction then, the first thing that we notice with a speech is that it needs to be fit for purpose. It needs to actually follow the format of a speech. So we must remember to do things like um, saying good evening, um, making that direct address with the audience straight away. And straight away I get into the actual question itself by putting our ideas into context, telling our audience what it is that we've been looking at and the guiding question that we're actually looking at. Otherwise, they don't know necessarily what the speech is going to be about. I've then immediately followed by answering the question, okay, giving your overall ideas in response to the question, and that shows the reader what it is that you're actually going to be talking about and gives them some sort of indication as to what they're going to be listening to as you go through. It almost anchors the entire speech. It gives it the meaning, um, so the thread for them to be able to follow. Now, in the example of how to structure an introduction that we looked at in the last lesson, you notice that I said we need a, a topic opener followed by appealing to the head. So use of facts, statistics, some sort of factual information, some sort of evidence that helps to add credibility to what it is that you've got to say. Appeal to the heart. So like emotive language, some sort of personal anecdote, something a bit more opinion based, and then a close, which we suggested would be like a, um, a rhetorical question to engage the reader perhaps, direct them to what it is that you want to be thinking about. So um, I've actually almost missed that uh, one of the sections out here. I've almost missed out the sort of appeal to the heart because I've, I've appealed to the head and I've actually used um, a quotation here that we looked at in class. Um, now, what's really important about that is it adds credibility to what I'm actually saying because it shows that somebody else, um, in this instance, a philosopher and social critic, so somebody who sounds like they know what they're on about perhaps, um, actually agrees with me. And it also, a, a second really powerful reason for including this quotation is it allows me to refer back to that at the end of my speech. It allows me to conclude by coming back to that um, really powerful um, quotation that's been used. Um, so what I haven't done here is appealing to the heart. I haven't particularly used anything emotive. I haven't used any really powerful adjectives, for example, or any ideas that are, are really emotional. So from an even better if perspective, maybe there could be a sentence in there as well, maybe before the rhetorical question at the end where I've, I've closed and appealed to the reader um, directly. There could have been something in there as well. Um, but just to draw on that, just to finish off, do we really think for ourselves or do we just believe in blind faith of things that were shown by the media? So this really clearly indicates what my speech is going to be about. And what's really important with this rhetorical question is not that I'm asking them a question, is that it's clear from my question what it is I'm going to be expecting them to be thinking about. So I'm not actually asking a question as such. I'm directing them through question to what it is I want them to be thinking about. Now moving on to this second paragraph, which would be your first body paragraph, the first one that actually really gets into the, to the um, answering the question and developing your ideas. You'll notice again that I've colour coordinated it, so you get the different parts of the paragraph. So in this instance, I've got my topic sentence. First of all, I begin with a connective to link my ideas together. And I'm answering the question. I keep coming back to this question. Are we responsible for our thoughts and deeds? I think we are. Okay. I then move on to give my example here. Now notice that I've given my example from Macbeth, so I'm relating it to things that we've actually been doing in our expedition, right back to our first case study and looking at whether Macbeth was responsible for the death of Duncan or not. So I've got one really clear sentence there that relates specifically to the question and my example of the question. And then my next two sentences are actually just developing the example. So I'm just saying more about why I've selected Macbeth as something that helps me to answer the question. All right. I've got some really good use of vocabulary here. Again, things that we've looked at in the expedition. 
So I'm almost taking what we've already learned and just rephrasing it into the form of a speech. Now in, in this particular paragraph, you'll notice that I haven't included an anecdote. Now, the main reason for this was because I wasn't necessarily wanting to reflect on something that happened in the 1600s and how I've witnessed it around me today, but also to demonstrate that maybe it could be even stronger if it had an anecdote in there as well. But I've missed out the anecdote part of the paragraph structure that we've been looking at, and I've gone straight in for the rhetorical question. So again, just looking at this rhetorical question, when was the last time you've been in a situation where you decided to not do something, only to be persuaded to do it, even though you still knew it was the wrong thing to do. Now, that's probably quite a long rhetorical question. It perhaps loses some of its punch and its power through being um, a lot longer. But again, I'm not just saying, what do you think about this? Um, what are your thoughts? I'm trying to guide my reader into thinking what I want them to think. I want them to think about any instances um, where they have been persuaded to do something that they didn't want to do. And interestingly, I've started this sentence with the word when. Now, there's a really subtle implication here. What I'm trying to say is there is a time when that's happened to you. So think when it was, not can you think of a time when, because that suggests that the answer might be no. I'm suggesting that the answer to this question is yes. Now, of course, that might not be the case, but again, that implies that I'm actually um, aware that this happens to us all the time. So you, you need to think of an example. That's what I'm saying to the audience. So just by starting with when, I've made that rhetorical question much more powerful. And then finally, I've got my solution at the end here. Okay, it doesn't need to be specifically complicated. We don't need to try and save the world here. We simply need to offer a solution. And again, by breaking the paragraph down into those different sections, topic, example or statistics, develop your example, ask a rhetorical question, offer a solution, even without the anecdote here, it's still a really well-developed paragraph. It feels like it's more convincing than just simply saying, think about Macbeth, he was manipulated by Lady Macbeth. Move on to the next paragraph. So moving on to my second paragraph. Again, I'm just really simply using connectives here to link my ideas together, to show that there's a progression and signal to the listener, to the audience, that I am moving on to a new point now. So to almost put the previous point just on a shelf and we'll come back to it. Okay, I'm making my point really clear with my topic sentence. Okay, my topic is for this paragraph is going to be about recent history. Okay, and how people have been exploited to, to make others more powerful. Now, the natural link for this, the obvious link of this, is to look at the stuff that we've been doing about Hitler, the propaganda posters. And again, look at this example. All I've done is written, what, three, four sentences that focus on the stuff that we've spent three weeks learning about. So this is almost like taking the information that we've done in our um, structural analysis, our source analysis, sorry, and turn it into the speech. Use it to add credibility to our speech because this makes it sound like I know what the propaganda did. I know what Hitler did. I understand it. I'm knowledgeable. And that gives my speech a lot more credibility. So the depth at which you go into this example gives you credibility. Now, in this one, I have included an anecdote here in this yellow, orangey colour. And again, you can see the difference, how it just makes it a little bit more personal. I've got a nice little um, adverbial phrase there at the beginning to add more structure to my, to my ideas. And I'm talking about a personal opinion here. I have witnessed this. I'm noticing that it's still around us today. Okay, And this leads me on to this rhetorical question much shorter, much more of a punchy kind of impact to it. And again, I'm not asking people to say, I have or I haven't forgotten the, the lessons of history. I'm implying that I don't think we have learned our lessons from history because of my personal experience with this anecdote that I still see it around us today, so we can't have learned. Okay, and then again, I've got a solution. You might have a different solution. You might not think this is an appropriate solution, but it's my solution really strong paragraph, a developed and detailed paragraph, which again, when you break it down into its constituent parts, if you look at the different colours, how it's been broken down, all form a really well-developed, extended paragraph. So something a little bit different. I'm answering the question in a 
slightly different way here. I'm changing. I'm no longer saying that I do think we're responsible. I'm saying that actually, you know, I know this is controversial, but I do wonder if we could actually be considered to be not responsible for our thoughts and action, actions. And again, I've used um, connective phrases such as controversially to show that I understand that this might not be a popular idea or that people would perhaps agree with me, which again, adds credibility to what I'm saying because I'm showing that I understand that people might think otherwise, but I've thought about it. I've considered that you might not agree with this. Now, what I've done in this one to show you is I've tried to play on some of these phrases and use much more of the phraseology that we've been learning when we've been looking at fake news. There's been some fantastic phrases polluting the, the well of civility in our country. How fake news is energized by the viral power of social media. Okay, These aren't my words, but I have made them my own. These are ideas that we've been looking at in class, expressions that we've been looking at that we can use. Now, I've taken an example here. So this blue section, again, is an example. But as with our paragraphs, the example can also be statistics. So I've included some statistics doesn't need to be overrun with them but just that simple introduction of 42 percent of web traffic science magazine said fake news spreads 10 times faster than real news it adds credibility because i'm not the only one who's saying this this isn't just my opinion this is based on fact this is based on research so even though the research may be questionable we're not questioning it at the moment but even though it could be questionable we are presenting it as if it is a fact and that adds credibility to what we've got to say. Again, we've got a personal anecdote. Now, don't worry too much about the fact that, you know, this, this was something that we studied in lesson. This is something that we looked at together. It's still an anecdote. You can still reflect on it personally. And notice how it is only three sentences, but actually two of the sentences are short. This one is a minor sentence because it's just one word. It doesn't have a, a subject. It's just got an adjective here. So even though it's grammatically incorrect, it has a particular effect. It emphasizes that word by having it in a one word on its own. So my anecdote, my personal anecdote is really straightforward, but I've tried to make this a little bit more emotive. I think in terms of even better ifs, I think overall this piece could be a little bit more emotive, like it is here, whilst the first two paragraphs tend to be a little bit more factually based. Fact and opinion, but the opinions aren't very strong. Okay, again, rhetorical question in green, and then in red, I've got some suggestions there in terms of solutions. Now here, again, I've played on this idea from a text that we read about the truth being vulnerable. And then I've used lots of imperatives. I've put the verb at the beginning of each of these clauses. Check, question, ask. Okay, And those imperatives help to make my message clearer and more directly addressing my audience. Alongside this final solution here, fight fake news. It's got a nice bit of alliteration to it with the repetition of F. And it's a really simple, short sentence. Makes it punchy. It makes it more impactful. And just moving into our final paragraph then, our conclusion. I've said in conclusion, but actually, this paragraph, if you were to read it through with uh, that connective phrase in there, compared to without, it doesn't actually need it. Now, I'm putting it in there to show that you can use connective phrases to signpost to the, to the reader, but I've actually used a more subtle device here to show that I'm concluding my speech and rounding it off nicely. So, I wouldn't necessarily need to use in conclusion, because... I'm referring back to Makokama Makwena and the opening paragraph. So I'm actually using a cyclical structure here to indicate that I am about to finish my speech because I'm coming back to the beginning. I'm coming back to my initial point. Okay. And then I've just sort of played around with my language a little bit here because this, you will have noticed, is from Macbeth. In Macbeth's final speech, poor player, okay, when he's saying tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, creeps this petty pace. So I've actually sort of paraphrased Macbeth there um, because it shows an understanding of the expedition. And I think it's a really interesting point that we are almost puppets 
um, controlled by the puppet master, this metaphor of our lives just being controlled by others, influenced by others. So it's not just an attempt to get some Macbeth in there. It actually fits in with the purpose of what I'm saying about how the media manipulators, our fake news is taking control, how Hitler tried to use propaganda. We are just puppets. We're puppets in Macbeth. We're puppets to propaganda. We're puppets to fake news and manipulation in the media as well. Okay, and then finally here, just as my last line, I've got an imperative again. I wanted to directly address the reader. I've gone from using a lot of we throughout this, creating this sense of unity, this sense of we're in this together. It's our society that's being controlled here um, to direct address, which doesn't necessarily always say you, but it's an implied direct address because I'm saying you challenge those who want to try and deceive us. It's up to you to do that. So actually by using imperatives, you are directly addressing the reader um, automatically because of the implied meaning behind it. So you'll see not necessarily the most flamboyant or exciting um, speech that's been created here, but there's a clear structure to it. There is clear structure to each of my paragraphs. And by using that simple structure within the paragraphs of topic sentence, example or statistic, develop your example, personal anecdote, rhetorical question, offer a solution, you can actually write a lot and make your ideas much more credible, much more developed and much more convincing.